the fourth part of our sizzling summer sensational preaching series. Can you say that with me? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> our series is entitled RealityTV.God. RealityTV.God. One of the reasons, again, I have chosen this particular title and theme is because whether you watch reality TV or not, some of y'all are a whole lot more uh, spiritual than I am, uh, <laughs> reality TV is a part of our culture. And whether you participate in certain things, you got to understand the mindset of the culture if you're going to effectively minister to the culture outside of the church as well as that same culture influences what's inside the church. So we have to understand how people think and what makes them tick. And yet we've talked about three different reality television shows. I'm not going to go through that list right now, but you can go to our website and go online and you can view and listen to these sermons online. But I want to <clears throat> use this particular reality television show today as the fourth part of our series. And it's the reality TV show Keeping Up with the Kardashians. I've, I've learned in homiletics that if you don't listen to Drake, be careful in quoting Drake. And if it's not Drake that you listen to, quote the temptations. I say this not to sound spiritual. I really am not a fan of the show, although I've seen the show several times. And there's certain parts that I certainly enjoy about the show, then certainly parts that are questionable. But according to Wikipedia, since I am not an avid watcher of it, uh, then the Kardashian, Keeping Up with the Kardashians is an American reality television show that stars on the e-cable network. As a matter of fact, it's E's number one show. It focuses not only on the personal, but the professional side of two families that are blended families, the Kardashian family and the Jenner family. Its premise was originated by Ryan Seacrest, who also serves as the executive producer of the show. The Kardashians, they debuted in October 14th in 2007. And they've been running every since that time as of last season, 14 season. And it has become one of the longest running reality TV series in the country, 14 seasons. What makes this show so attractive? That was the question I had this week. And I did a lot of Googling and reading a lot of blogs that people were fans of, and people just had comments that weren't necessarily fans of, but they had observed the show. And it seems to be sort of a love-hate relationship, even to the point some people hate the show, but they continue to watch it. <laughs> some say that the Kardashians are famous for simply being famous. <laughs> that, that fame, some experts say that the experts say, I don't know them, and so I'm not judging them, neither am I judging their show in particular. But some of the experts describe the family itself as rich and self-absorbed and desperate for fame. And no matter what we might think about that, but the reality is every single time that show airs, there's at least two million plus people who are faithful viewers of the show, fans of the family. And I know this is a real spiritual crowd, so, but before you say, I never watch a show like that. I, I, I'm not into that kind of garbage. I, it's just too much drama. It's, it's too worldly. It's too whatever. There's a reason why I'm preaching on this subject matter following the Kardashians. It's because I realize if you really want to be transparent and honest before God, there's a little Kardashian in all of us. See, the people on this side ain't feeling me. It's like. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that all of us are chasing after some of the same ideas and ideologies and the reasons why the fans watch this show. We're all pursuing or either being pulled and influenced by some persuasion of this world and of this culture that takes us away from the values of God and from the glory of God. It takes us away from, pulls us away from or we are attracted, attracted to something of God that is not of God, if you will, that 
we cherish, we have become fans of. We can't wait to engage in looking over our shoulders to make sure no one else is watching at times. But it's in our hearts. A chasing after something, a pursuing after something in this lifetime that pulls us away from the glory and honor of God. The reality is we are living in between two stark, unchangeable realities. Our birth and our death. If I were to take this back a little further, not just with our birth and with our death, we're in between these two inescapable realities called eternity past and eternity future. What I mean by that is, is that God has a plan designed for our lives. That's the reason why he created us and we were born into this world, the first book into this reality. And at the same token, it's inevitable that all of us are gonna to have to die the second bookend. And we live between those two bookends in the front of us in our future is this eternity because the reality is death is not the end. It's only a, a comma, not an exclamation point to our life because we were created by God to live forever. There are a lot of people this week who went to sleep and didn't wake up on this side. I got three phone calls just this week of friends of mine that lost loved ones. One dear sister and member of our church, when we first started and they moved out of this area, went to sleep. She's my age. She went to sleep and she didn't wake up faced with her second reality, death, 59 years old. I called a pastor friend of mine, Dr. Ricardo Bartlett that you've heard here, brother, dear brother of mine, and all my preacher friends went to Dallas to a conference I didn't get a chance to go to this year that I normally go to, expository preaching conference. We had been texting all week and they'd been telling me just, several preachers I know, how good it was. And then I called Doc and I said, man, how's things going? He said, they were going good, but he told me the name of the preacher. And he says, you know him from Detroit. We came here together. We're sitting downstairs waiting for him to come to breakfast and he never answered his phone. We went upstairs and found him dead in his bed. Talked to another friend of mine. He said, man, I'm just checking to see how you're doing. He says, we were on our way to bury my sister in Tennessee. Went to sleep last night and she didn't wake up. Inescapable realities. And what we have to do is figure out what is that ultimate goal in life and finding a single passion that we can not only live by, but that single passion they will die for, that we will die in. What is that single passion that defines life for you? It defines significance for you. What is that single great passion that all of your values are established on? What is that single passion beyond careers, beyond job, beyond money? What is that single passion beyond the pleasures of this world? What is that single passion that you live by that you'll have to die by? Because when you take your last breath, you won't get a chance to do it again. Is it the Kardashian lifestyle? Or is it something else? Just one verse I want to share with you as a platform which I want to build this case today. It's found in John chapter 6 and verse 35. John 6 and verse 35. Listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Listen to me carefully. 
He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. Now, now I want to start with this first point of consideration here, that is this. I want to say what Jesus did not say, that we get confused when we hear or we read this verse. Jesus did not say that I came to bring you bread. Jesus emphatically says, I am the bread of life. He didn't say I come to give you bread. Understand this today, church. One of the greatest reasons why we're not totally satisfied and have not found even in the church that single great passion to live by in this life is because we've bought into this very, very, very bad idea that Jesus said, I have come into the world to give you bread. Bread, i.e. money, wealth, material goods, success, promotion on your job, successful careers, beauty, health. Jesus never ever said that the reason why I exist, the reason why I took upon human flesh in my incarnation, the reason why I was born of a virgin, the reason why I live a pure life for over 30 years, the reason why I died on a cross and was raised from the dead is so that I could give you a slice of bread. Yet in pulpits all across America and the world now for that matter, we hear men and women who stand in this sacred office in these pulpits proclaiming the Kardashian gospel. And they want to forge Jesus' signature to the sermon that Jesus came to give you bread. He didn't say I came to give you bread. He says I am the bread. Now, now, he may give you some bread along the way, but that is not the reason why he came into the earth. Matter of fact, when the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Jesus says, I'll be glad to teach you how to pray. And in a part of that prayer, he says, and then you say to the Father, give us this day our daily bread. This is Jesus. But notice what he said that comes before that, that the giving of daily bread is based on, but is secondary to. He starts off by saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And while you're at it, if you don't mind, can you give a brother a slice of bread? <laughs> you first, the bread of life, then the slice of daily sustenance. We've got to twist it. Now many people come to Jesus because of that bad gospel, which is really no gospel at all, no good news. Because they heard the message that Jesus came to give you bread. Matter of fact, we tell people, and people say, yeah, man, my life all jacked up, made bad decisions, man, my business gone down the drain, I started off in college, it didn't finish, man, my, my house is all messed up, family separated, split up, and, and now I'm dying of a disease, and, everything. and we say, so all you need to do is give your life to Jesus. He's going to turn it all around for you. He's going to make things better. Hold on, don't clap yet. The reality is, accepting Jesus, your circumstances may get worse after knowing Jesus instead of getting better as before you knew Jesus. Because he didn't come to give bread. He came that we might have life. And that we might have life more abundantly and eternally. And so there are folks that have heard this bad message. Jesus came to give you some bread back when I was, back in the day, back in the 70s. Guys would get, get paid and they'd get their paycheck. They said, man, you got some bread? Yeah, I got some bread. You know what I'm talking about. I got some bread. That bread was that money. So what happens when people embrace that false gospel, 
they fall in love with the bread that Jesus gives, but they never tasted the bread of who he is. This is huge void in their soul. This God-shaped vacuum that never is filled. So they're never satisfied. But you know what I've discovered, church? Sometimes Jesus has a way of snatching bread out your hand to show you that he is the bread that you're yearning for. God has a way of taking away that job, taking away the money, taking away the income, taking away our health, taking away our, 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 the people that we say that we love the most. The things that are most precious to us and that we have cherished above himself. And he says, I only did it because I love you because I want you to see you've been missing something. You've been missing me, the loaf of life. And you've settled for slices at a time. This is what we have to understand, that Jesus didn't come into this world to be useful to us. He didn't come into this world to be beneficial to us. No, 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 you might not like that wording, but this is the best wording I could come up with. He didn't come into the world to be useful to us or to be beneficial to us. He came into this world to be cherished by us, to be adored by us, to be prized by us, to be worshiped above all by us. That's the reason why he came. Yet the majority of Christians probably, no doubt, they come to Jesus because they think that he's useful. He's beneficial. There's some earthly benefit in knowing Jesus, and so therefore he's useful. Another way of saying it is, Jesus didn't come into this world to assist in meeting our desires that we had before we got saved. Jesus came into this world to change our desires. so that he is our ultimate desire. It's not Jesus plus something. I talked about this before and mentioned this. It, it, the greatest equation of all of life, I believe, is just Jesus plus nothing equals everything. It's not Jesus and a supplement, Jesus and an addendum, no. It's Jesus, no additives, no preservatives, no artificial fillers. And I'm going to say it again, and this is yet what we hear called gospel all across the pulpits of the world today. Jesus came into the world to meet your desires, to fulfill your plans and your ambitions and your goals in life. Because Jesus wants you to succeed. And if you want to be rich, if you want to be well off, if you want to be noticed, and if you want to have even great health, it's amazing. We can always have faith for great health, but don't have enough faith to eat right, to exercise, and to do what we need to do on our part. And I'm talking about Christians and even preachers. So then we come up with all of these misquoted, taken out of context past the scripture, because God has called me to be the head and not the tail. We don't even know the context in which that is mentioned. So then we say, just trust in Jesus, then he'll give you the desires of your heart. Yes, I'm very familiar with Psalms 37, but I also believe that I know, at least in part, the core significance in the interpretation of what it means. When he says, I come to, that, that, you might, that I give you the desires of your heart, the words that proceed giving you the desires of your heart are these words, delight yourself in him, delight yourself in him, and he will give you the desires of your heart. This word raka, the word delight, it means to be bent towards and find total satisfaction in. It means to be bent towards him. Delight yourself. And then what will happen is he'll change our heart's desires to match his heart's desires. That's what it means to be bent. One of the greatest works of salvation, regeneration, and sanctification is that God would change this sinful and selfish and prideful heart. That's the work of salvation. It's not just to get us into heaven, but it's change and transformation along the way. Now, I can look at your faces and tell by your consonants, you say, Shh, I ain't get out of my bed this morning and come here all this now. Got all dressed, took a shower, put on my smell good. 
went out and bought me some new earrings yesterday to match my dress and my shoes. And this dude up here yelling at me, talking about don't be watching the Kardashians. I never said that. Yeah, they, you know, that we shouldn't have this. And we, I never said you shouldn't have this. And that. We're talking about the pleasures of the heart, our ambitions, what we strive after, what we work for. no sin to have, but it's a sin for those things to have you. We spend all of our lives working for bread, one slice at a time. And it's bread that never really brings meaning significance. Matter of fact, in Luke's gospel, Jesus gives us an interesting parable that is fitting for this preaching occasion. Luke chapter 12 and verse, beginning at verse 16, Jesus spoke this parable to his disciples and he said to them, the grounds of a certain rich man yield plentifully. In that verbiage, really what he's really saying is, I don't care what this man did, he profited from it. <laughs> hey, God just blessed him like that. Sometimes some folks, some folk can start a business and you got all the business, you got MBAs, you got all these and listen, it doesn't mean that you're not smart, it doesn't mean that you're not doing the right thing. It just don't happen. Or don't happen in this season. But this man, the text is really saying that this certain rich man, he yields plentifully. It's like no matter what he did, he just stopped making mega money from it. And listen what happens and how he turned inwardly to himself. And he took God completely out of the equation. Notice how many times he speaks of himself. Notice. Jesus says, and he thought within himself. Nothing wrong with that. Saying, listen, what shall I do since I have no room for my crops? So he said, I will do this and I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Listen to his heart. Listen to his early retirement plan. Take your ease, eat, drink and be merry. But God said, isn't it interesting when you hear what man got to say, then it said, God breaks in and say, but God said, in other words, you can say whatever you want to say, but God's got the last say so. The man said, I will, my stuff, my bond, my crop, say to my soul, sit back and relax, eat, drink, and live with Mary. Something like that. <laughs> but God said to him, fool, oh foolish one, this night your soul is required of you. In other words, you got 12 hours to live, bro. This is the second bookend of your inescapable reality. And notice what he says, and then whose things will be which you have, which he says is sarcastic, which you have provided. Who's going to spend your stuff? Because what God is really saying is because you certainly ain't taking any of it with you. And I can imagine Jesus' audience was going, wow, poor dude. He got it all screwed up, turned around, excuse my vernacular. He got it all messed up. He's losing it all. And then Jesus said to his audience, so is he. <laughs> so anyone who lays up treasure, somebody say treasure, for himself and is not rich toward God. You've got treasure for yourself, but you're not rich in eternal purposes. You never found that one key passion to live for and to die in. 
Jesus made it clear in the verse preceding this passage in verse 15, one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. You can live a Kardashian lifestyle if you want to, but listen, one's life does not consist. It can't be defined by the things that you possess and the trophies that you hold in this lifetime. <laughs> you know, when I look at this, the reality is he was probably the envy of his city. Everybody wanted to be like him. He was Bob Kardashian. Just had it all together. I said, man, I wish I could drive a car like that. I wish I could live in a house like that. Man, I wish I had a, a swimming pool like that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. I, I wish I had a lifestyle. Man, this dude, 35 years old, about to retire, about to eat, drink, and just be merry on his yacht. I wish I could have that. And Jesus said, that ain't what you want. If I bless you with it, that's one thing. But to strive after it. So 750 years before Jesus spoke this parable, Jehovah God spoke in, through the mouth of Isaiah in Isaiah 55 and 2, and he asked a loaded question. I hate when Jesus asked a loaded question. They load it like, Chee -chee. why do you spend money for what is not bread? Why do you spend money for what is not as but that, that really doesn't satisfy? He, he says, and your wages for what does not satisfy. You find temporary happiness in it, but it never really fills the longing of you. So why do you work so hard for all of this and to build this dream for what? And you're still not happy. You still got to pop pills just to make it through the day. And you're still finding love, false love in all the wrong places. Why? You're still not even securing yourself. You want everybody to look up to you, admire you, and think that you're all of this. Because you don't even know who you are. He says, why do you work hard for that? Notice what he says. He says, listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully. Take heed to what I'm about to say. And this is the first thing he says out of two. Eat what is good. Swallow and digest what is good. Absorb in your soul what is good. And then he says, and when you find that which is good, that single passion, great passion to live and to die for, then let your soul delight itself in the abundance of it. Just don't sample it. Some of, some of us want the peace of Jesus that we think is useful and beneficial. Growing up, a lot of you like myself, you know, it wasn't often, but every now and then my mom would get some of that Sanders candy. Saunders, I think they pronounced it. I'm, I'm dating myself now. And it was a mixed box of chocolates. You know how you take the lid off and then you got the little paper under there and you fold it back. Now the reality is, it's all different shapes that are sitting down in this preform little deposits and all covered with chocolate, different shapes. But it was like a guessing game. You had to like look and see which one that you thought you might like. When mama would turn her head, I would just look at them real closely, all covered with chocolate. It's like, ah, I don't know if I ought to eat this one right here because last time I ate it, it tastes like wood chips on the inside. Then you say, ah, that got the cream, and I don't like that cream stuff, right? Y'all yeah. know what I'm talking about, that cream, I don't like that cream stuff. And then as kids, you bite it, then, ah, I don't like it. Instead of throwing it away, you're going to put it back in the box. <laughs> like, ain't nobody tell that that was bit off of. And you keep going until you find the one you like, and then you try to memorize it in case you get another box of chocolate next time. And you remember the shape because it's all covered in chocolate, but this is my favorite one, and these are the ones I don't like. And I found that we treat Jesus like a box of chocolates. We try to find that part of the word that we like. 
We keep tasting, nah, I don't like that. That's gonna require too much commitment. No, nah, I don't like that. That's gonna require a sacrifice. Ah, that's kind of bitter right there. I want that blessing chocolate. <laughs> that sweet chocolate with the little cherry just floating around inside the cream. The Lord says, listen to me carefully. What he's saying is, please don't miss this church. Eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. If I can open that up for a minute and try to exegete this passage, is that all right? Okay, God bless all six of y'all. Amen. The rest of y'all hang in there. And let your soul delight. Let's deal with the latter part first. Let your soul delight in abundance. To better understand these words from the Old Testament prophet, we need to probably put them on the backdrop of the words of Jesus in the New Testament gospel that we've just read from John 6:35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life and he who comes to me will never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So let me start with this. Jesus is the bread of life. So, so when God says, listen, listen, listen carefully, eat what is good, the question is what do we eat? We're eating Jesus, absorbing, savoring Jesus above all because he's the bread of life. But you gotta ask yourself the question, why did Jesus refer to himself metaphorically as bread? Because then in ancient Palestine as well as today even here, bread is a staple in our meal. How many of y'all like bread? Y'all want to raise your hand because you got a gut like me. Ah, uh, they don't know. <laughs> but the reality is you got bread and water, you can survive. The Jewish people love their bread. Matter of fact, Jesus in the wilderness provided manna down from heaven, bread. And the reason why he did it in the Old Testament, in the wilderness with Israel, is to show that in the coming of the New Testament, when the Messiah comes, that he is that bread of life that allowed you to sample in the wilderness in your lostness and in your desperation and hunger. And Jesus says, listen, I am that bread. I'm all you will ever need that will satisfy your ultimate hunger because I'm all satisfied. But not only that, but Jesus was saying that, like he did in other passages, I'm not only the bread of life, but I am that living water. And he said, he who believes in me shall never thirst. Never is a powerful word, and he used it twice. Never, as in ever. You will never, ever be hungry again because you find that, found that thing that is all satisfying all-encompassing it takes care of everything in life Christ and Christ alone and you found that water to quench your thirst you see we got it twisted what we want to do is turn from sin to 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 exercise some kind of sin management so we're gonna if I can say this very candidly turn from porno and fight against it we're gonna turn from these addictions and fight against it and we're gonna turn from using bad language and fight against it we're gonna try to turn from greed and materialism and fight against it and covetousness and envy and anger and bitterness and try to fight against it and that's the wrong thing to do the thing is when you truly find Jesus satisfying then you turn the computer off until you're totally satisfied with Jesus, everything else in this Kardashian world will become attractive to you. And even then, you've got a fight on your hands. But the way you stop this is you start this. Does that make sense? He says, if you come to me, here's the key. If you come to me and believe in me, notice what Jesus did not say again. He didn't say like we say, and I understand the implication behind it, but he didn't say if you make a decision for me. We say, well, you know, we're going out today and we're going to be doing some witnessing so, so we can get some decisions. Jesus didn't ask you to make a decision. 
A decision of what you do when somebody witness to you, give you a track and, and, and ask you to turn or burn. And if you know tonight you're going to die, whether you're going to accept Christ or, or, or come to church and there's an invitation given that says, will there be one? Will someone make a decision? What we do is we make a decision one day in a point of time, but there's no more decisions that are made after that. You don't make just one decision for Christ. No, Jesus says the key is not making a decision. We're not making a decision for Christ. Believing in Christ is not just a decision that we make. No, believing in Christ for salvation is desiring and savoring Christ like a hungry man who is starving and a thirsty man in the wilderness who are dying of water from thirst. We recognize that. That Christ is totally savored. And it's Christ and Christ alone, and he's the only one who can fulfill that hunger and thirst. Bread and water. Seeing and savoring Christ and Christ alone above all. But notice what he says, coming and believing. <laughs> coming is the one, again, who is starving to death. And true believers realize that we're starving to death. And Jesus is the only one who is that bread that can satisfy us? Believing, believing that he's the only one who can quench that thirst, our soul delight. This is that single great, greatest passion that we could ever live for and die in and with. To delight ourselves in the Lord. The Lord Jesus, our bread of life, our well of living water, springing up, totally satisfying. Let me tell you this, church. Don't waste your time and please don't waste your life following the Kardashian or we say in my generation, the Joneses. And if your last name Jones, just hang on because everybody else is trying to be like you. Don't get it confused and please don't twist the word, word of God and manipulate the word of God to pretend that we're truly seeking Jesus, the bread of life, and ultimately the only thing we want is the bread that he has to give, but we don't want that loaf of life. So you can come to church and we can play all of that. Jesus knew that. He dealt with it. It's the age-old problem. John chapter 6, beginning with verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, listen to this, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, the signs of God, that I am uh, the son of the living God, that I am the Messiah, the Christos, the anointed one of God. You, you didn't seek me because you saw those signs as it was revealed to the, the disciples that, that, that you are the son of God. No, he said, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. You, because I gave you fish and loaves miraculously, it tasted good and it filled you up. That's the reason why you come seeking from me. You want another miracle. You want another blessing. You want another deliverance. He says, I know what you really want. You want a slice of bread, but you don't want the loaf. Jesus said, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food, somebody say food, which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. And listen, he is not just handing you bread. Listen, because God the Father has set his seal on him. In other words, he has made him the bread, not just the giver of the bread. Let me close out with this last point. I always like to make sure it's plain. So what is this single passion to live by? What does it mean when I say this single passion, great passion in life? What does this hunger, in other words, and thirst, and this coming and believing, what does it really look like? If I could just sum it up very simply, it would be treasuring Christ above all. Somebody say treasuring. Treasuring Christ above all. Jesus gave another parable that is short, Matthew 13, 44. This is sort of his abbreviated version of a longer parable that he's given in the other gospel. But Jesus says, listen, again, the kingdom of heaven. Christ is king and having this relationship with him in his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is a mindset, is a heart condition. The kingdom of heaven, listen, is like treasure 
hidden, buried in a field, which a man found the treasure and he hid the treasure. Don't miss this. And for the joy over it, for the joy over finding this treasure, notice what this man did in heart and then his actions. He goes and sells all that he has to buy the field. Consider it. We got a man, he's taking a short cross, shortcut across somebody else's property to get to his crib. And as he's coming across this field, he trips up over something. So what in the world? Takes the heel of his sandal and realizes that ain't gonna do it. So he goes and breaks a limb off the tree and he starts digging around it. And as he's digging around it, he realizes it's a box. So now he starts digging to unearth this box. And when he finally gets it out of the ground, he opens up the lid that has been buried there for years. And he sees all of these jewels and the riches of the world. He's like, oh my God. Because you want to make sure nobody else don't see that thing. So this is what the text says that he did. Jesus said he did. And then he buried it. He put it back in the ground. Now I know what most of us would have done. We would have scooped that up and took it on home right then and there. But you're missing the point that Jesus is trying to make. He put it back in the ground and he buried it. And here's the key. And for the joy over it. For the joy because it brought the treasure, brought so much joy that he treasured the treasure so much so that he went home, put his house up for sale, still watching the treasure to make sure that no one steals the treasure. But he realized the only way I can own the treasure is I got to buy the land that is owned. Here's what I'm trying to say and what Jesus point Jesus is trying to make to his audience. Some folk want the treasure, but you don't want to buy the land that is on. You want the blessings of the king, but you don't want to abide in the kingdom. Because the parable is, is the kingdom of, of God is like. Jesus says, sell out. Go home and sell out. He's not necessarily saying put your house up for sale and sell your cars. He's saying, listen, sell out to the idea those things give you status. Sell out to the idea as those things make you look special in the eyes of somebody else. Sell out to the idea that these are the tokens of your success. Sell out that this is what makes you happy and that will satisfy you. It won't, he says. It's a meaningless Vain pursuit, ask King Solomon who had everything. And he came to the conclusion, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Life is like a vapor and you try to grasp it in your hand and it slips through your fingers. So God has given us life so that we can make much of Christ and show that we treasure Christ above life itself. God has given us possessions so that we can be reminded that the way that we use them, we can show that the possessions aren't our treasure, but it's Christ that we treasure above the possessions. God has given us money so that we can use it in such a way that we show that money is not our treasure, but it is Christ who is our treasure, so we're willing to give the money away. But what does treasure in Christ really look like then? Paul did a great job of describing it in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, New Living Translation. Paul said it this way, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else is worthless in light of knowing Christ for his sake, for his sake, I have, listen, uh, 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 compared, I went, uh, uh, discarded everything, counting it all as garbage, so that I can gain Christ. Listen to me carefully. So when and if you lose that job, you lose that income, you lose that health plan while losing your health, you lose that car, 
You lose and have to bury a family member. Remember that you lost. But if Christ is truly your bread, in your loss, you had your greatest gain. He said, I consider all things lost in light of knowing Christ. In other words, when I had the job, I'd already lost it because I came to treasure Christ. I worked diligently, but I was working to glorify Christ. I was working to put food on my family's table. I was working to enjoy some pleasures in life. I enjoyed them, but I did not allow them to master over my passions. So what Paul is really saying is that if you must choose between Christ and anything else, we would choose Christ. People, that's one of the hardest struggles because we sing songs that we really don't mean. Silver and gold, silver and gold, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. And as soon as we lose a little piece of silver. I thought you just said last Sunday, silver and gold, I'd rather have Jesus. How they gonna fire me? How they gonna get rid of my department? Ain't gave nobody no notice, no nothing. I don't work for this company for 21 years and they just going to get rid of it and even let me come into work, going to send me an email. I thought you said you'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. Nah, I can't pay my car payment. I got this new car. I thought you said you'd rather have Jesus than silver and go, I ain't got no insurance and can't get my scripture filled. And I, I, I didn't say that it was going to be easy. You ain't going to never hear me say that. But I will say this. All of us catching hell, whether you know Jesus or not. But I'd rather know Jesus going through hell than not know him while going through. I, I, can't, I can't even imagine what it's like to not know him and go through the difficulties of life. So in between our birth and our death, again, is these two inescapable, these two inescapable realities. I have to make a choice. Do I want to follow the Kardashian gospel or do I want to follow the Jesus gospel. Do, do, I, do I hunger for Christ? Do I pursue Christ, the one I was pursued by? Do I come to him and believe that he's the ultimate eternal satisfaction to satisfy my soulish taste buds with joy, joy unspeakable? So that's what Paul meant, no doubt, when he came to this conclusion and Philippians 1 and verse 21, he says, for me to live is Christ. And he's, Paul says, if I had to define and sum up all of life, it means to live for Christ. To live for Christ. And he says, so therefore I have no problem with dying is gain. Dying is advantage because all that I have lived for when I die, I finally come into the reality of what I have been hoping for. How did he come to that place? Maybe it's the verse... In verse 20 to verse to proceeds 21 in this passage, Paul says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will, listen to this, be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. In my living or in my dying. There are missionaries who are dying and being slaughtered even now, persecuted. And I wonder, can we really say that Christ is magnified not only in my living, but even in my dying, so that even when I die, I know my death is not in vain. Here's the wonderful thing I figured out <clears throat> having this single 
greatest burning passion between these two inescapable realities, birth and death, eternity past, eternal future. You don't have to be the smartest person. You don't have to be the richest person. You don't have to be the most successful person. You don't even have to be the most beautiful person. You ain't gotta be the most talented person, the strongest or the fastest person. You don't even have to be the most spiritual person in order not to waste your life and to live your life for Christ. You just have to know a few simple but yet wonderful, magnificent, glorious, unalterable, clear, life-changing things about God and embrace those things about him passionately and allow him to set your soul on fire. I need to say this, but with an audience this size, and those who are watching and listening outside of these walls, there's a multitude of people under the sound of my voice who don't want to make their lives count. I wish I could say differently. Here's what I mean, there, there, there's some people that really don't care if they are making an eternal impact on the people that God has placed around them. Now, let me say it another way. Now, most people are probably more concerned about getting people to like you than you are in loving Jesus. More concerned about what people think about you. You're more concerned about establishing your own reality TV show that you got viewership and followers than you are about living out that single passion for God. You're totally satisfied with the idea of a comfortable lifestyle for the sake of being comfortable. The goal and ambition is that you have a great job and that you have a great career so you can make great money, so you can drive that nice car that people will take notice of and live in that wonderful house that people will envy and wear the most fashionable clothes to make yourself look good and go to all the major entertaining events so you have something to talk about. And then save enough for retirement so that you can retire with ease and travel the world and then sit back and prop your feet up from all of your labor that you worked hard for and diligently for and save your money for this day. You're going to eat and you're going to drink and you're going to be merry. That's your life ambition and enjoy hard, all your hard work and sit back and sip on your Long Island iced tea and say, this is it. And here's the sad reality. Most people who say this is it can't even define what the it really is. I've been there and done that. I've done all those multi-level marketing seminars and they present people driving Bentleys and got yachts and houses here and there, 32 years old, retired. I never have to work another day in my life. Even as a pastor, I started thinking about that, shoot. I can't wait till I retire. I'm gonna get body of Christ, shoot, man. Maybe 64, 65, I'm coming up out of this piece. Then I realized close you get to it, I ain't got no money to come up out this piece. Yeah. But then I got to ask the question, if I had the money, would I stop serving God? Not only would I stop preaching, but let's just say I work for the postal service. Or let's just say I work for the SPCA. Or let's just say I'm in the military. Would I, whatever it is that I do, whatever my career might be, do I stop giving my all to God? I don't understand this. Even in church, we, we got the, I hate to say it because I'm just about in that category, the old folk, the retirees talking about, well, you know, back in the day, I would have done this and I would have served in this ministry and I would have done this. You got more time in your hand and you know what to do. You don't have to get up and go to work. You ain't got no calendar. You ain't got no schedule. Your house is paid for. You still driving that hoopty from 17 years ago. Listen, you ain't got no kids. The grandkids don't even want to come see you. And you talking about if I had some, listen, if I was younger, I would, what? Amen. 
Then all the people in their 30s talking about telling the truth, tell the truth. Let me see what you do when you get to retirement age. And here's the question, what does that enjoyment really look like? So, so Jesus has made this distinctly clear, clear. That ain't it. That it that we're thinking about is not it. But following and chasing ultimately after Jesus, that's it. Groping after him, that's it. That's more satisfying. Because God has created you for more. You're bigger than that. Than just to work all your life and sit back and want to sip tea. But then on the other hand, there may be someone in here, and I pray, and I have been praying, now as I close out this sermon, that you've heard the word of God, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And you come to the conclusion, I want this bread. Man, I want in on it some kind of bad or wild now. And then you might say, Reb, tell me what I have to do, what I have to do, what I have to do to do to get this bread and to get this water that I'll never hunger and thirst again. Well, let me tell you, if you have that hunger and you have that thirst, there ain't nothing you have to do because God has already done it for you. You see, he's the one who places the hunger and thirst inside of us. You just can't make yourself hungry and thirsty. You're already desperate. We're talking about hunger, hungry and thirsty, hungry for the bread and thirsty for that well of water. He put that desire inside of us because yesterday you didn't have that desire, but you got that desire today. It's, it's, it's not, let me tell you this, it's not because you decided now that I want it, that that's when it happened. No, God has placed it inside of you. That desire for him, listen, because he wants you to desire him. Let, let me say it another way. This is the reason why God ought to get all the glory and the praise and the honor. Our hearts are so corrupt and so bent towards sin, so in love with ourselves and so filled with pride so filled with worldly pleasure, pleasures that we cannot believe and have faith in God on our own. It's not our desire. Because of this spiritual corruption from the day of Adam, we cannot as fallen creatures simply choose to believe in God, simply choose to trust and have faith in Jesus Christ and to receive salvation unless Christ creates that hunger and that thirst in our soul. Another way of saying it's like spiritually blind people decide when they woke up this morning, well, I think I want to see, and they see. Simply because they want to see. No, Jesus is the one that says, eyes open and see, and then we see. Spiritually dead people, they're not laying in a spiritual coffin and say, I think I want to live, and I'm going to make myself live. No, it's Jesus who calls the name of the dead and causes them to rise up into everlasting life. People who are held spiritually bound in sin and the slavery of sin, you cannot liberate and emancipate yourself. A slave cannot win his own freedom. Someone has to purchase that person to liberate and emancipate him. And that's what Jesus did some 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross by his own blood that he shed. He redeemed us and he ransomed us and liberated us from the slavery of sin. That's the reason why the songwriter could write the words, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can, can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, oh, how precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fun I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's that single greatest.
passion that you can not only live for, live out and die in, and be totally satisfied. Jesus, that bread that promises, if you come to me, you'll never hunger again. Jesus, that well of living water, greater, deeper, and fresher than Jacob's well. They said, if you drink of this water, you'll never, ever thirst again. And don't worry about the water running up, running dry, the well drying up. You may not feel it today, but he says, oh, tomorrow morning. It's a wellspring of water that springs up every single day. And he gives fresh and brand new mercies every single day. He invites you to this all-satisfying supreme joy, a joy unspeakable, indescribable, but you know when you have it. Let us pray.